Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Not Just a Hashtag, Legislation Created by Me Too. My partner, Amy Halevi, and I are looking forward to what we hope will be a very informative and interesting discussion this morning. But before we get started on our topic at hand, I also wanted to remind you that this is the first in our series of three webinars tackling a variety of state and local employment law issues. Tomorrow, you can join Leslie Bird and Amber Dodds for a webinar covering various paid leave law topics. And then on Thursday, Bob Nichols will be presenting on drug testing, marijuana, and CBD laws and trends. Each of our programs um, are available for CLE and various other types of credit. And so you'll receive an email um, after the webinar with more information regarding that. Lastly, I did want to note that we always try to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and if for some reason we are continuing our discussions beyond the hour mark, we know some of you have to log off and leave. But we did want to let you know you're welcome to stay logged in and the program will continue until we actually finish. All right, let's dive into our topic. As the Me Too movement turns two, it gives us a nice opportunity to take a look at the legislative landscape and see that this social movement has actually turned into tangible legislation that does impact employers. It's a little bit ironic as we sit here on election day, it's uh, timely to talk about this topic which focuses on actual legislation enacted. Um, as many of us go to the polls to vote into office, the lawmakers who write and enact these types of bills. Um, our goal here today is not necessarily to provide a comprehensive primer on every state law enacted in the wake of the Me Too movement. We do understand many of you on the line will not have employees located in the states we discuss. But what Amy and I believe is significant is the rapid pace of these types of laws being enacted in various state and local jurisdictions and some real trends that we're seeing develop. So in reviewing the laws on the books now, you very well may have a preview of what might be enacted in your jurisdiction in the future, or even potentially at the federal level in the future. So we plan to cover um, these areas of key legislative impacts in the wake of Me Too, uh, laws that have required uh, mandatory training in various states, enhancement of employer policies, actual material changes in the harassment standards, expanded coverage of harassment laws, restrictions on non-disclosure agreements, limits to mandatory arbitration, and increasing salary history bans. 13 states have limited or prohibited employers from requiring employees to sign any type of non-disclosure agreement as a condition of employment, or, or in some cases as part of settlement agreements. This is something that has typically been very common for employers to use, confidentiality agreements during the scope of the employment relationship or in a settlement agreement, clauses and provisions that state something to the effect of this agreement, the discussions and the underlying facts leading to this agreement are confidential. And certain states and localities are now saying that employers can no longer use these tools. 10 states and New York City have enacted various prevention measures, such as mandatory training and very specific policy requirements for employers. And five states have expanded workplace harassment protections to include independent contractors, interns, graduate students. So we're seeing the expansion of potential areas of claims for employers. Four states and New York City have extended their statute of limitations for filing harassment and discrimination claims making it easier for individuals to bring claims longer after the harassment allegedly occurred. So when we look at these laws, these new laws are in the books, you can tell that the legislation is really focusing on the causes of workplace harassment, things like lack of training, lack of clear policies, um, potentially a lack of consequences for harassment in the workplace. The laws are also targeting procedural mechanisms that permitted bad behavior in the workplace to continue without redress. That would be things like confidentiality requirements, um, escaping liability due to certain standards, 
or the fact that a supervisor may not have actually had supervisory status for purposes of harassment claims, and also legal aspects that made it difficult for claims to either be filed or proceed. Things like an employer being too small, so they're not actually covered by the harassment laws, or an individual is not a covered worker because they're a contractor, or statute of limitations periods being so brief that individuals didn't necessarily have time to file their claims. So the first topic that we'd like to cover is mandatory training laws that have been enacted. And what we're seeing in the area of employer training on sexual harassment is the expansion of the type of employers required to provide training, an increase in the frequency requirements of such training, and really specific elements that are required for training in order for the employer to meet its requirements. And again, you can tell that the legislative goals are promoting prevention strategies in an effort to stop harassment in the workplace before it begins, and if not, to ensure that the workforce understands what to do in response. So diving into some examples of actual state laws, California previously only required employers that had 50 or more employees to provide sexual harassment training to supervisory employees just once every two years. Under its new law, the 50 employer th employee threshold has been reduced to employers with just five or more employees being required to provide at least two hours of interactive sexual harassment training and education to all supervisory employees. And here's another expansion, at least one hour of such training to all non-supervisory employees. And so again, whereas before, didn't necessarily cover your smaller employers, didn't necessarily cover non-supervisor employees. California says everybody's covered now in those areas. <clears throat> the training in California can be completed by employees individually, or it could be part of a group presentation. Um, also, with respect to the time requirements, it can be completed in shorter segments, as long as the applicable total hourly requirement is met. In Connecticut, we'll see a very similar trend. Only previously law required employers with 50 or more employees to train supervisory employees. Now Connecticut has taken it down to cover employers with three or more employees to provide sexual harassment training to every employee. And again, those with even fewer than three employees are required to provide that training at least to supervisory employees. And with respect to penalties for failing to meet these requirements, in California, uh, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing can issue an order mandating the training. In Connecticut, the penalties are a little bit um, more meaningful in the sense that uh, an employer can be subject to a $1,000 fine for failing to provide training. And the law is not clear if that $1,000 is per employee. Moving on, once again, similar to, Delo to California and Connecticut, Delaware enacted legislation to require employers with 50 or more employees, so they're keeping that higher threshold of, of size to, to provide interactive sexual harassment prevention training and education to employees and supervisors. So although they've kept the larger size for coverage, they've expanded um, the training to essentially all employees, not just supervisors. And you'll see, we're gonna talk about all this concept of interactive training a lot something, again, a trend that we've seen in, in these laws, and what does that really mean? Um, interactive training is a type of training that would really engage its audience. It would ask questions of the participants. Uh, it would answer participant questions. It might engage role-playing activities and group discussions. So it's really aimed at, as opposed to an individual just being um, spoken to, um, that the individual is actually engaged in the training process. Illinois has enacted legislation that requires its professions that have continuing education requirements to include at least one hour of sexual harassment prevention training in those requirements. And the Illinois law is very specific in terms of what the program must include, um, an explanation of sexual harassment, examples of conduct that qualifies as sexual harassment, summary of relevant state and federal provisions and remedies, and a summary of the employer's responsibility in preventing, investigating, and correcting sexual harassment. And the Illinois law, again, provides for some monetary penalties for failing to comply, 
can be up to $5,000 for a repeat offense. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amy, and she's going to compare the New York City training requirements with the New York State training requirements for us. Thanks, Becky. So in response to Me Too, both New York State and New York City have enacted legislation that requires employee training on sexual harassment. And there are a lot of similarities between the state and the local requirements, which is very good for New York employers with uh, employees in both the city and the state. Uh, one such uh, common requirement is that they require, as Becky just talked about, this interactive training. And as Becky noted, that's definitely something we're going to see in, in most, if not all, of the state legislation. The New York state legislation took effect on October 9th, 2018, uh, and it applies its training requirements to every company with employees in New York State. doesn't matter how big or how small you are. In New York City, though, the training requirement only applies if you're an employer with 15 or more employees. Another difference between the two laws in New York State and New York City is that in New York City, uh, they've stated that they encourage employers to train their independent contractors, uh, particularly those who are working at the employer's workplace, are interacting with the employer's staff, and are anticipated to work more than 80 hours in a calendar year and for more than 90 days. Again, we're going to see this trend of states trying to include independent contractors or at least strongly encourage, in the case of New York City, employers to train their independent contractors. And it's probably a good idea for employers. If you've got independent contractors who are there for a considerable period of time working alongside your employer, other employees, uh, it's probably a good idea to think about including them in some type of training. All New York State employers were supposed to have completed the training uh, for employees by October 9th this year, and then there's an annual requirement thereafter. For New York City, you've got a little bit longer. It's December 31st, uh, 2019. Uh, New York City training uh, requires bystander intervention uh, training, um, which we're definitely uh, seeing uh, a trend with regard to this type of training. In fact, the EOC sample training program includes bystander intervention, intervention training. And it was something mentioned in that EOC task force on harassment that came out a few years ago. Uh, bystander training is really designed to give employees tools uh, to try to stop harassment. And it's focused not just on the person who's the recipient of the conduct, who the conduct is directed to, but just somebody who happens to hear it or be standing by and it, the goal is to try to tell those people you also have an obligation, a requirement to really help us stop the sexual harassment. Uh, New York City has developed a training uh, program that it says satisfies both the state and the city requirements, so that's something to think about. Uh, and it will include this bystander intervention training uh, that we just talked about. Uh, in terms of the elements of the training, uh, there's a lot of similarity between the two. And, and frankly, there's a lot of similarity between just not just New York State, New York City, but the trends we're seeing in, in other states. Elements including an explanation of what sexual harassment is, consistent with the guidance in that state, in this case, New York, uh, including examples, something Becky just mentioned. It also requires that the employer provide information on the applicable laws and information on the forums available to employees to adjudicate complaints, meaning filing a charge of discrimination and or a lawsuit. Uh, I think this is really important to note because think about sort of how we've done uh, training in the past. We haven't always uh, encouraged employees in training programs to, to show them how you file a charge of discrimination or this is where you go to file a lawsuit. So this change, which is, again, part of a bigger trend, uh, is something that's, I think, important to, to pay attention to. Um, as noted, the elements of New York City's required training are very similar to New York State, include explanation of what it is, examples, et cetera. Uh, the training module I mentioned for New York City, uh, you should feel comfortable using that. Uh, with regard to both New York State and New York City, but keep in mind, employees still need to be informed of the employer's internal complaint process, which obviously is going to be different with each uh, employer, 
So you don't want to just feel like you can give them that New York City training and that will be enough. You have to make sure they understand as part of that training what your employer uh, particular requirements are or process uh, is for making an internal complaint. Uh, one thing that's important to keep in mind about these new requirements uh, is that the, you should look at the state's um, rules with regard to record keeping because they also vary from state to state. Uh, the record keeping requirements, for example, in New York City uh, are that employers are really just encouraged to keep a signed employee acknowledgement of training. But in New York City, employers are actually required to maintain records of employee training, and that goes for at least three years. And that includes a signed employee acknowledgement of the training, uh, but that can be in an electronic form, which is going to make many employers happy. Um, so that takes care of mandatory training. Becky, why don't you start us off on some of the other change, changes we've seen? All right. So the first topic here is uh, new policy notification requirements. And again, the legislator focused on um, how employees, uh, you know, are made aware by employers of the employer policy on sexual harassment discrimination and uh, their rights to be free from those things in the workplace. You know, no anti-harassment or anti-discrimination law it would be effective if uh, individuals in the workplace are not aware of those laws and their protections. And so um, these various state and local laws are focusing on making sure that employees and other workers are aware of their avenues to combat harassment discrimination in the workplace. And we've seen in 2018, California, Delaware, Illinois, New York City, and Vermont enacted legislation requiring employers to post or share with their employees information about their rights to be free from sexual harassment in the workplace. Then in 2019, Connecticut and Oregon followed. Connecticut is interesting in that its um, requirements also include providing employees with a link to the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunity Sexual Harassment website. So not just having your own policy prohibiting it, but actually showing them where they can read about it and where they can lodge complaints. Oregon's also has a little bit of unique elements. Not only does the policy prohibiting harassment have to be provided at the time of hire, but if an employee actually comes to the employer and discloses information about concerns regarding discrimination and harassment, the employee has to be reminded and given um, the policy. Moving on from policy notification requirements, uh, certain aspects of employer policies are required to be enhanced. We look at Washington, they've actually enacted legislation to establish a state women's commission to address certain issues such as best practices for sexual harassment policies and training. Their state EEOC is convening a working group to develop model policies, again, something that Amy talked about that occurred in New York, and best practices to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Oregon's legislation requires all employers to adopt a written policy to reduce and prevent discrimination, which includes harassment and sexual assault. The policy has to provide uh, not just a process for an employee to report the discrimination, but it also actually has to outline the statute of limitations to expressly tell individuals how long they have to bring these claims and also expressly include language that prohibits non-disclosure agreements, uh, something that Amy's gonna get into more detail later. <clears throat> the state of New York's legislation required its Department of Labor uh, to, pu to publish model sexual harassment policy, including at a minimum the following, prohibiting sexual harassment and providing examples of conduct that would actually constitute unlawful harassment, talking about the federal and state statutory provisions that address harassment and the remedies that would be available. And it has to include a standard complaint form, which this again is a development that is very different from what we would typically advise employers in the past. This would be an actual form that makes it very easy for individuals to lodge a complaint and start that process. More requirements in New York include a procedure for the timely and confidential investigation of complaints and ensuring due process. Previously, the, the model policy was going to require investigations within 30 days of an employee's report. They have changed that to say as soon as possible. 
They've also, uh, initially, their model policy was going to require a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment and retaliation. That actually has been removed, um, which really brings the state's guidance in line with the EEOC's position, which disfavors the use of that term. The EEOC sees that zero tolerance policy language actually as a deterrent to employees reporting. So that's been removed. Um, but also, the New York policy requires investigation documents to be kept in a confidential location. And this is really important. It notes that written documents of the investigation need to include the basis for the decision regarding the res resolution of the complaint, not just the statement of any corrective action that will be taken. The New York employer policy has to inform employees of all available forums for adjudicating sexual harassment complaints. Again, something that we ne wouldn't necessarily have previously done now the policy has to be clear where employees can bring claims. And we've just got the link here for the New York uh, information that you can peruse. Because there's a lot of requirements, you know, many employers want to just follow the model policies and use the toolkit there. But know that these documents contain the minimum standards and you can adopt your own as long as it is compliant. All right, now I'm going to pass it off to Amy. She's going to cover a really significant development, which is a material change in the harassment standard in certain jurisdictions. Thanks, Becky. Uh, as Becky noted, we think this is really one of the most important uh, trends to pay attention to. It, it has a, a significant impact in terms of litigation of sexual harassment claims. So let's first talk about what the federal standard is. Um, as most of us know, in, under the federal law, in order to be actionable, sexual harassment has to be severe or pervasive enough to create a work environment that a reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive. Uh, the United States Supreme Court case, Berger versus Ellers, um, talked about this standard, and the court explained that the severe or pervasive standard is intended to ensure that actionable sexual harassment claims arise only as a result of extreme conduct. Uh, Title VII, the court noted, does not prohibit simple teasing, offhand comments, or even an isolated incident of offensive conduct that is not in itself extremely serious. So many in the Me Too movement uh, focused on this standard, and they argued that it's just too high. It was too high a burden, they argued, because it meant that many plaintiffs who sued in sexual harassment cases were not, success, were not successful. In fact, they uh, rarely got out of uh, summary judgment. So at this point, California and New York are the only states to have successfully done away with this severe or pervasive standard. Uh, these laws lower the standard of proof in sexual harassment cases and make it much more likely for plaintiffs to be successful. Uh, while this Change in the standard really only applies in these two states. As I said, this is definitely something to keep an eye on. Other states have laws already uh, uh, being introduced that talk about this standard. Minnesota, for example, has a bill that's been introduced. Uh, but additionally, I think we could see the EOC come out with new guidance that um, sort of uh, is turning it uh, away from that severe or pervasive standard. Okay, let's briefly talk uh, about California. Uh, in California, uh, the law makes clear that a single incident of harassment is sufficient to create a hostile work environment if the harassment has unreasonably interfered with the employee's work performance or created an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Uh, and that's important. We, you know, obviously, we've always known that one particular, you know, one incident could be severe, uh, you know, particularly if it's some type of sexual assault. But in most sexual harassment cases, we're relying on the fact that, you know, a single incident alone is not going to be sufficient. So that's a big change. Also, the California law says that the victim, the employee, need not prove that his or her productivity declined due to the harassment. It's sufficient to prove that the harassment made it more difficult to do the job. This is also an important change. Really, employers typically would point to employees who were performing well and maybe very successful at their jobs. Uh, and when those employees were claiming that they had experienced sexual harassment that was severe or pervasive, had this significant impact on them, employees would say, well, wait a minute, it couldn't be that significant because you're performing well. Uh, and obviously then employers would say, not so severe and it wasn't, didn't have that type of impact on you. 
but now uh, California has clearly rejected that standard. The California law uh, makes it clear, and this is particularly interesting, that the new legal standard applies to all workplaces, regardless of whether a particular occupation has historically been associated with a higher frequency of sexually related comments or conduct uh, more than other occupations. I thought that was a particularly uh, unique statement. Uh, it's likely meant to respond to the argument we've heard in some industries, perhaps like the oil and gas industry, uh, that have male-dominated work environments uh, where employees, uh, some have tried to argue, could should expect in those types of industries that are male-dominated uh, you know, perhaps they should expect some level of horseplay or sexist comments. I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I think that's an argument we've seen. But California, again, has clearly rejected that. Like California, uh, the New York state law instituted a lower burden of proof for claims. Uh, interesting, New York City actually abandoned severe or pervasive. That's uh, the standard in 2005. But New York eliminated the standard very recently in that new legislation, effective October 11, 2000 this year. Uh, harassment on the basis of sex or other protected categories will be an unlawful discriminatory practice in New York, regardless of whether the harassment would be considered severe or pervasive under precedent applied to harassment claims. This legislation applies to all discrimination and harassment claims, so it's not just claims based on sexual harassment. The New York state law also did away with one prong of the Farragher-Eller uh, affirmative defense. Uh, they did away with the component that part of the defense, which talks about that the employer can get out of liability in part by showing that the employee didn't make a complaint. Remember farragher and Eller, uh, that Supreme Court case uh, provided there was an affirmative defense to supervisor sexual harassment as long as it did not culminate in a tangible employment action. Uh, if the employer exercised reasonable care to prevent and correctly correct promptly any sexually harassing behavior, and also that second prong, if the employee unreasonably failed to take advantage of any preventative or corrective opportunities provided by the employer or to avoid harm otherwise. So uh, in New York, they've done away with that second prong. Uh, we, you know, other limits to employer li liability presumably still apply. Uh, Example conduct, we think, should still have to show that a reasonable person would have found it to be offensive in order for the employer to be liable. Also, they didn't change the coworker harassment standard. So, in that situation, when you're just dealing with coworker harassment, not supervisors, arguably the employer is only liable if it knew or had reason to know of the harassment. Uh, given the changes in California and New York, uh, it may be advisable for employers in those states to think about what type of training it should uh, engage in for its employees. If they need some type of workplace stability training or uh, impose a workplace stability code where you know they know in those states the standard uh, is going to be lower. Just to make sure employees really understand that even you know tasteless humor or offhanded remarks could result in company liability. Uh, we are probably going to see an increase in claims in those states. We haven't yet, but I, I, we think it's, it is likely going to be the result. Okay, Becky, why don't you tell us now about the changes in the standards for supervisors? Sure. So two states in particular, Delaware and Maryland, have tackled the issue of employer accountability for harassment by lower level supervisors. There's a 2013 United States Supreme Court decision, Vance v. Ball State University, which ended up limiting victims' ability to obtain redress under federal law when they experienced sexual harassment by a lower-level supervisor. That case held that when employees with the authority to direct daily work activities, but not the actual authority to hire, fire, and take other tangible employment actions, harass their subordinates the employers were not necessarily vicariously liable for that harassment. Now, again, it doesn't, an employer doesn't have to have liability only when a supervisor harasses, but the uh, threshold for liability for the employer goes down significantly and the employer becomes vicariously liable, liable for that supervisor's behavior. So in carving out lower level supervisors, 
again, um, this makes it harder for individuals to bring successful claims. So Delaware has now said that a supervisor includes not just an individual who's empowered to take actions to change the employment status of an employee, but also anyone who directs the employee's daily work activities. Maryland similarly includes those that have the power to make decisions regarding the employee's employment status and also those who direct or supervise or evaluate employees. So in addition to expanding uh, who's a supervisor for purposes of vicarious liability, some states, Delaware, Vermont, and Illinois, have actually included expanded worker coverage. Um, employees covered by sexual harassment protections uh, for Delaware now include unpaid interns and applicants, also joint employees. In Vermont, the protection against sexual harassment and the liability imposed on companies has been expanded to all people engaged to perform work or services independent contractors, volunteers, and interns. Same thing in Illinois, contractors, consultants, and any individuals who are contracted to perform services. And so this is a, a significant development uh, because employers in, the, in these states ha now have more exposure to claims from all types of workers, not just employees. And it also places a burden on the company to take a more active step to engage and supervise workers that are traditionally have been treated very differently than employees. Most employers know that in an effort to avoid contractor misclassification risks, the general approach has been not to provide any type of training to independent contractors or have your policies cover employees and contractors the same way. But now employers in states that offer harassment protection to these service workers uh, need to think about things like providing training, and Amy touched on that earlier, and having policies in place that prohibit harassment of contract workers. This coverage has also been um, expanded in Maryland and New York, uh, expanded on existing 2018 legislation by passing legislation in 2019 to ensure that um, all of these service providers are protected not just from sexual harassment, but actually from all forms of discrimination in the workplace. In addition to expanding the types of workers that are covered by harassment protection, certain legislation has expanded the types of employers that are covered by harassment uh, legislation. Two states in New York City have extended anti-harassment protections to smaller employers. Maryland has gone ahead and extended its protection from all forms of harassment to all employers, regardless of size, the same has happened in New York. And again, in New York City, they enacted legislation to extend gender-based anti-harassment protections to all employers, regardless of the number of employees. And finally, Many states have adopted legislation that extends statute of limitations on harassment claims. Again, this is something that employers are likely to experience more claims because now employees will be less often time barred. Connecticut extended its statute of limitations from 180 days to 300 days. Maryland took it farther, extending its statute of limitations for filing claims with its state commission from six months all the way up to two years, and then from two years to three years for filing workplace harassment claims in court. New York extended its statute of limitations from one to three years, the state, as did the city. And finally, Oregon extended its statute of limitations all the way from one to five years to file a complaint with its state harassment agency. All right, Amy, why don't you take us through the topic of secrecy and uh, developments in an employer's ability to keep harassment claims quiet. All right, in this next section, as Becky mentioned, we're gonna focus on confidentiality of sexual harassment claims. Uh, we're gonna to touch briefly on restrictions on non-disclosure agreements or NDAs as well as other areas where state legislation has been enacted to try and ensure that sexual harassment claims remain public. We're also going to briefly discuss a change in the most recent federal tax law that deals with this topic. 
An employer's ability to maintain confidentiality of sexual harassment claims has certainly been challenged in the Me Too era. It's something we hear a lot about. It's been challenged because the argument is it's a mechanism that allows bad behavior to continue. I mean, you can look even at the most recent example of what came out with this, uh, the Matt Lauer issues. And the focus now, obviously Matt Lauer is gone, but the focus now is what NBC knew and when, and whether or not NBC had actually previously entered into settlement agreements with other women who claimed to have been sexually harassed. And they did that to keep them quiet uh, and allow the alleged harassment to continue. The focus on confidentiality in the Me Too era has manifested itself on the state level primarily in two ways. First, uh, laws that limit the employer's ability to enter into non-disclosure agreements. And second, laws that limit confidentiality provisions in settlement agreements. Uh, it is important to note, I think, when we're talking about NDAs, that many employers have NDAs and confidentiality agreements with their employees, and, and most really deal with things that are perfectly fine, like intellectual property or company trade secrets. The issue really just arose when uh, you started seeing very broad uh, confidentiality agreements or NDAs that really looked a lot more like non-disparagement agreements, uh, where they really um, a deterrent, perhaps, for employees to uh, come forward and uh, talk about uh, whether or not if they experience sexual harassment or some type of sexual misconduct. Uh, but again, most employers who have NDAs, those will be fine as long as they're not so broad that they appear to be more like uh, non-disparagement clauses. Um, although the focus on this webinar is on state laws, I think it's interesting that the federal government has been doing something in this area. Uh, in February of this year, uh, the uh, Empower Act was introduced in the U.S. Senate. And if you want to know what EMPOWER stands for, it's kind of a mouthful. It is ending the monopoly of power over workplace harassment through education and reporting. Uh, and that bill, among other things, uh, prohibits employers from requiring non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreements as a condition of employment. A similar bill has actually been introduced in the House, and both are in committee. All right, so let's go back to state laws briefly. Uh, there are a number of state laws on this topic, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on each one. Uh, California, not surprisingly, is one of the states that now prohibits NDAs that would prevent employees from disclosing unlawful workplace conduct, including sexual harassment. Uh, Illinois has also enacted a new law prohibiting confidentiality provisions that prevent employees from disclosing truthful information about discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. Uh, it is important to note that the Illinois law has a fairly easy process employers can follow if they want to have confidentiality provisions and agreements. Uh, the confidentiality provisions are going to be allowed when they are a mutual condition of employment, negotiated in good faith, and acknowledge the employee's right to report allegations to the appropriate government agency or official, participate in agency proceedings, make truthful statements required by law, and request and receive uh, legal advice. Uh, under Illinois law, the agreement must demonstrate actual knowing and bargain for consideration from both sides. Uh, both Maryland and New Jersey are, are states that have enacted similar laws, as well as um, others uh, like in Tennessee that expressly uh, protect employees from retaliation if the employee refuses to sign an NDA uh, covered by one of those statutes. Uh, New Jersey's law, uh, which we'll mention briefly later, also addresses non-disclosure provisions and settlement agreements and has some interesting language about when the employer can discuss the details of a claim. New York's law, uh, similar to Illinois, uh, includes that an employer can enter into a confidentiality provision provided it provides notice to the employee of his or her right to speak with law enforcement, the EOC, state and local agencies, or even an attorney. Uh, Oregon, we've mentioned a couple of times uh, already this morning, um, like many of the other state laws, prohibits agreements preventing the disclosure of discrimination, including harassment or sexual assault that occurred in the workplace, uh, at a work-related event, or between the employer and an employee off the employment premises. That last point is sort of interesting. Tennessee and Vermont are added to the list of states that have enacted laws prohibiting non-disclosure agreements regarding sexual harassment. Virginia and Washington are also on the list. Uh, an interesting point on uh, the Washington law, 
uh, is that it provides exceptions for human resources, supervisors, or managers who are expected to maintain confidentiality as part of their job. And frankly, I think most would have implied that uh, in some of these other laws, but it was interesting to see. It also excludes employees who participate in an open and ongoing sexual harassment investigation and are requested to maintain confidentiality during that investigation. All right, Becky, I wanted to talk about that second aspect of uh, confidentiality that we've seen, and that is uh, the provisions with regard to settlement agreements. Sure, so this is a little bit of a nuanced difference. Amy discussed general non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements, but many states have enacted laws prohibiting confidentiality provisions in agreements that settle a sexual harassment claim. Again, this is something that is a standard part of a, a settlement agreement typically in the past. An employer felt like that was part of what it might have been paying the settlement proceeds for is bargaining to uh, move on from the issue and not have it discussed, you know, oftentimes because the employer felt strongly that it had not done anything wrong and did not want, um, you know, misplaced information out there. But um, the legislation has really focused again on the concept that individuals uh, ha have been allowed to perpetuate harassment in the workplace because claims are settled confidentially. And so uh, others don't know that the behavior has actually been going on in the past. So California is one of those states, again, not surprisingly, that prohibits confidentiality provisions and settlement agreements. Interestingly, though, the law does not apply to pre-litigation settlements. So it does only apply to claims that were filed in court or filed in an administrative action. And claimants, of course, can request a confidentiality provision if they want to protect their identity. That is, unless a government agency or a public official is a party to the settlement agreement. And the prohibition, at least, does not apply to confidentiality with respect to the amount paid under the settlement agreement. So that can still be kept confidential in California. In Illinois, employers have been prohibited from unilaterally imposing a provision in a settlement or a termination agreement, so more broadly an agreement that may be signed pre-litigation um, that prohibits these disclosure requirements. Illinois has taken an interesting approach and uh, provided the opportunity for a confidentiality provision where it's do the documented preference of the employee and is mutually beneficial to both parties. Now, what that means, how you would prove it's mutually beneficial to both parties, we have yet to see. But here's some elements that you'll recognize from another law uh, that most folks are familiar with with respect to separation agreements. The employee has to be told they have the right to have an attorney review the settlement agreement. Um, there has to be consideration for the confidentiality. The provision can't waive future claims of harassment, discrimination, or retaliation. And the employee has to be given 21 days to consider the agreement and seven days to revoke the agreement. So someone very creatively took the elements of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and said, hey, that makes sense in terms of confidentiality agreements in settlement agreements in Illinois. Nevada has enacted legislation prohibiting employers from including language in a settlement agreement. Again, that, pro that discloses, prohibits the disclosure of facts and circumstances related to a civil or administrative action um, related to sexual harassment or discrimination. Again, the amount of the settlement can still be kept confidential. <clears throat> and New Jersey has said that any non-disclosure in a settlement agreement is unenforceable against the employee if it has the purpose or effect of concealing the details related to a claim of discrimination, retaliation, or harassment. New Jersey does have a little bit of an odd provision that a settlement agreement actually has to include a notice that specifies, even if the parties have agreed to keep the settlement and underlying facts confidential, that provision becomes unenforceable if the employee publicly reveals sufficient details of the claim so that the employer then becomes reasonably identifiable. The New Jersey legislation also creates a new form of retaliation that employers need to be careful about, 
The legislation prohibits retaliation against an employee who refuses to enter into an agreement with an unenforceable provision. So employers in New Jersey have to be careful if they present a settlement agreement to an individual and that settlement agreement has one of these prohibited provisions and the individual fails to agree to it, there can be no retaliation against that individual. New York, again, prohibits non-disclosure provisions in a settlement agreement unless it's the complainant's preference. And New York has also adopted this 21-day concept, seven-day concept to revoke if it's the complainant asking for the confidentiality provision. <clears throat> New York's 2019 legislation also has added some additional protections for the complainant choosing to enter into a non-disclosure agreement, requiring that that provision has to be written not only in plain English, but also in the primary language of the employee. And it also has to provide that that provision is void if it prevents the employee from participating in an agency's investigation. So in other words, if the individual needs to talk to the state EEOC, um, that provision must state that they're permitted to do so. Again, a similar requirement in Oregon, if you're going to have a confidentiality provision, in a settlement agreement, it can only be one requested by the employee, and the employee has to have seven days to revoke the agreement. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Amy, and she's going to talk about um, some of the laws that are impacting arbitration. Thanks, Becky. So arbitration became even more appealing to employers following the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Epic Systems in May of 2018. Uh, many employers, including many of our clients, uh, revisited arbitration uh, now that they realized it was a way to resolve employment disputes and prevent employees from bringing collective or class claims against employers. Interestingly, and perhaps ironically, at the time when mandatory employment arbitration was experiencing a resurgence, uh, the Me Too movement came along and created a new challenge for employers who were considering arbitration. Uh, Me Too movement criticized arbitration on the basis that it is a private way to resolve disputes. Arbitrations aren't uh, publicly filed. Uh, and many argued that that permitted employees to continue to engage in the harmful conduct. When we talk about the state law uh, challenges to arbitration and the states that uh, have enacted this legislation, federal legislation, we really have to discuss it in the context of the federal law, the Federal Arbitration Act. The FAA permits employers to enter into agreements with employees that require employees to submit disputes to binding arbitration, as opposed to submitting those claims in a court of law. Despite the strong language in the FAA, though, a number of states have enacted laws to ban employers from requiring employees to arbitrate sexual harassment claims, as well as, in some cases, discrimination claims in general. Uh, with certain variations, uh, these states include California, Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, I'll talk about New York in a minute, uh, Vermont, and, and Washington. Uh, New York is interesting because uh, their ban on arbitration was recently found to be preempted by the FAA. Uh, I think it's important to note when we're talking about trends, even though obviously the focus here is on, on state laws, that some large companies in response to Me Too uh, didn't wait for legislation. Uh, Companies including Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Uber, Lyft, and eBay uh, agreed to no longer require employees to arbitrate sexual harassment claims. I will say Google agreed to do this uh, after 20,000 employees walked off the job in November 2018. Uh, some of the laws prohibiting mandatory arbitration, uh, California would be an example of this, uh, apparently recognizing the FAA issue do include language that the law includes a written arbitration agreement that is otherwise enforceable under the FAA. Uh, some of the laws that Maryland and Vermont would be two of these examples do not actually specifically mention arbitration, but provide that any provision that weighs of substantive or procedural right or remedy to a future sexual harassment claim, or for example, in New Jersey, all discrimination claims, uh, those types of agreements would be null and void as against public policy. While that language is broader, doesn't specifically mention arbitration, it's certainly been interpreted to include arbitration. Uh, interesting to note, uh, again, in this area, the states have been enacting laws that the federal lawmakers have been unable to pass. Uh, federal law 
makers have tried. Um, there was the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment Act of 2017 uh, that attempted to outlaw arbitration for allegations of sex discrimination. Uh, that bill did not even advance beyond committee and is certainly dead at this point. Uh, as with many of the state laws we've talked about, but frank frankly, particularly in this arbitration area, uh, employers are wondering uh, whether uh, there's a preemption issue and whether, in this case, the FAA is going to preempt state laws banning or restricting mandatory employment arbitration. Uh, certainly, the United States Supreme Court could not have made it clearer that state laws that interfere with arbitration's fundamental attributes are inconsistent with the FAA and are preempted. Uh, just this year, in New York's law faced uh, this challenge and lost. Uh, the Southern District of New York and Latif versus Morgan Stanley held that New York's ban of mandatory arbitration of sexual harassment claims was preempted by the FAA. The court noted that the FAA sets forth a strong presumption that arbitration agreements are enforceable, and this presumption is not displaced by New York state law. When we discuss the FAA's preemption of state laws and possible action by the United States Supreme Court, ultimately, uh, we should keep in mind a couple of things. First, the current and likely near future makeup of the United States Supreme Court, uh, which has already ruled in favor of arbitration in landmark decisions in the past two years, is extremely unlikely to read the FAA as allowing states to circumvent the fundamental attributes of arbitration when it comes to sexual harassment. Uh, additionally, when we analyze this issue, I think it's important to note that the Supreme Court is not going to be able to look at language either in the FAA or in Title VII that would support carving out sexual harassment claims from the party's right to agree to arbitration. And just as a note, when you look at the Supreme Court uh, cases on this topic, certainly Epic Systems, LAMPS Plus, but take a look as well at Kindred Nursing Systems versus Clark, which was a February 2017 U.S. Supreme Court case, which held that the FAA preempted a Kentucky state law uh, regarding arbitration, limited arbitration. So where does this leave the state anti-arbitration laws? Uh, well, uh, Congress could amend the FAA to permit state laws that prohibit arbitration of sexual harassment claims. Probably unlikely, but possible. Uh, another option may be for states to attack this issue a little differently. Uh, so instead of legislation that makes any arbitration agreement that includes sexual harassment claims unenforceable, the states could simply prohibit employers from entering into arbitration agreements that require the parties to maintain confidentiality when arbitrating sexual harassment claims. Because after all, that's really the basis of the complaint in the Me Too movement that these arbitration uh, uh, proceedings were all private and therefore the bad actors uh, were able to continue to engage in the conduct. Uh, it is interesting to note that although the uh, uh, American Arbitration Association and JAMS rule, which are, are, are procedural um, programs that many, many employers use with regard to arbitration, uh, while their rules require arbitrators to maintain confidentiality, there is no AAA or JAMS rule stating that the parties must keep the facts confidential, although that's something that employers sometimes have in their own agreements. Uh, while laws prohibiting confidential arbitration of sexual harassment claims, while those types of laws might appease the Me Too, Me Too movement, it's not going to make employers feel much uh, better about this because obviously employers, one of the things they like about this, uh, about arbitration, is that it is in fact confidential, but it's not in the public domain. One recent change in the law in response to Me Too uh, that actually took place at the federal level is worth noting. Uh, it's a provision in the new tax law that was signed by President Trump in December of 2017. Uh, the new tax law addresses the tax deductibility related to sexual harassment settlements and states that no deduction shall be allowed for any settlement or payment related to sexual harassment or sexual abuse if such settlement or payment subject to a non-disclosure agreement. Also applies to any attorney's fees related to such settlement or payment. Uh, this uh, provision uh, got some press, although uh, perhaps not as much as we were expecting. Uh, and it was a little confusing at first because it, it 
on its face didn't distinguish between employees and employers with regard to the deduction. But that has been clarified now. The Joint Committee on Taxation has stated that any attorney's fees incurred by the beneficiary of the settlement or recipient of the payment are not subject to this rule. Uh, the IRS informal guidance in their uh, frequently asked questions also states that recipients of settlements or payments related to sexual harassment or abuse are not precluded from deducting attorney's fees related to a settlement. So it only applies only applies to the employers in terms of losing that deduction. All right, so when we uh, think about what this means to employers, it's going to be helpful to come up with sort of an example, which I and I and I did take this from somewhere else because I thought it was particularly helpful. So it shows on the example, which I'm not going to go through point by point, but you can see the value to the employer if they in, if they do not include a sex a uh, confidentiality provision in the settlement agreement. It's clearly a saving to the employer if they can take advantage of that deduction. Having said that, I think it's really too early to tell if employers are going to opt out uh, of the confidentiality provision. It is so ingrained in settlement agreements, uh, particularly uh, an agreement that deals with something that is uh, a sensitive topic. Employers really are going to want that to be confidential if they can. All right. Thanks, Amy. We're going to hit our very last topic here right at the end, which is um, salary history bans. And while this isn't directly relevant to um, workplace harassment and misconduct that Me Too sought to bring to light, sexual harassment and pay inequity arguably are based on a similar premise that gender and other stereotypes lead naturally to the presumption of an individual's lesser societal value, which is sort of a building block upon which inequity can be based. So many state legislatures are trying to tackle the idea that there's gender-based pay inequity in the workforce uh, based on historical underpayment of um, females in the workplace. And so a salary history ban is something that prohibits an employer from asking an applicant about their current or their past salaries or benefits or their compensation. Most of these laws also prohibit the employer from trying to get this information elsewhere other than through directly through the applicant, you know, such as asking the applicant's former employer. And this kicked off with a ban in Massachusetts, but it's since spread to 17 states and 19 localities. Um, and the, again, these laws are aimed at ending the cycle of pay discrimination under the rationale that you know, setting current salary based on past salary can per perpetuate the wage gap. So it's something for employers to keep in mind um, in states that have these laws, in localities, something that is rapidly becoming adopted. And so keeping an eye on that and ensuring that individuals who interview don't mistakenly ask that question. Um, it's certainly something to keep tabs on. That being said, uh, salary history legislation has spawned a backlash against such bans, you know, with some states feeling like employers should be able to freely select employees based on sort of their current compensation situation and where they would like to go moving forward. So to this end, Michigan and Wisconsin are the two states that have actually declared a interest, a state interest in permitting employers to solicit salary history, and so they have and salary history bans. So that takes us to the end of our presentation and slides. I think we have maybe just one quick minute to answer one question. Um, so here we've got one on arbitration and I'm gonna kick it over to Amy to answer since she addressed arbitration. The question is for employers located in states or jurisdictions that don't have laws limiting um, the forced or mandatory arbitration of harassment-based claims or confidentiality requirements related to the arbitration of harassment-based claims. Do you think that those employers should go ahead and carve out mandatory arbitration of harassment or keep things as is? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think with regard to arbitration, I would focus on, on two points 
uh, in that question. First, these state laws that are banning arbitration with regard to sexual harassment claims, I think are subject to significant challenge from the FAA and may be preempted. The other point is just that with regard to sexual harassment, I, I wouldn't carve that out if you don't have to, partially because I think employers could face a backlash against employees who might have a claim of harassment based, for example, on race or national origin. And they might argue, why do I have to arbitrate my claim uh, when somebody who's making a sexual harassment uh, complaint uh, doesn't have to arbitrate that claim? For, so for those two reasons, primarily, I would not do that carve out unless they have to because of one of these state laws. All right. Thanks, Amy. All right. Well, that wraps up our webinar. Again, we hope it was informative and you'll get an email following up um, regarding slides and CLE credit. Thanks and have a great day.